From your perspective, what's the problem with safe spaces at universities in particular? Well, I think um, where the idea begins, which is to say that you know some students, when they've uh, having experienced trauma or significant setbacks or oppression, um, they want a space on their own where they can feel relaxed and they don't have to feel um, embattled by you know various people. I think that from uh, on on that just uh, basic perspective, it seems acceptable, and I think uh, people have a hard time saying no to such a thing. It seems kind of ridiculous, except in practice, it is one of those things that leaks into campus life in general when students come to expect that there are times and especially uh, within classrooms where they can feel that they must be protected from certain ideas and especially that they must must be protected from ideas that are uh, troubling to their identities and unfortunately too many students think that uh, their politics are part of their identity and this makes it very difficult to talk about politics in general to talk about social issues that are so important um, in in our discourse and that it makes things uh, very difficult in college campuses and I know that there are people who you know they dissent from uh, the I guess the norm thinking in in college campuses and they have a hard time speaking up they have a hard time uh, saying their piece and just expressing intellectual disagreement because they might be hurting someone's feelings or identities and they, they don't want to be called a bigot, they don't want to be called hateful, so they are silenced. And this is a very unfortunate state of affairs. I don't think anybody thought that it would end up this way, that this is where we would be, but this is where we are. And we have to look back and see where, where did we go wrong and what can we do to change it. Well, isn't it nice not to hurt people's feelings? What's the problem with that? Why, why not do that? Well, it's absolutely, it's, it's, what is nice is not the same thing as what is good. And I think that sometimes uh, people on the left and liberals in general confuse those terms. You know, they think that what is nice and what is going to uh, make people happy is the same thing as doing uh, the right thing in any circumstance and doing a good thing. So when it comes to specifically people who are under, you know, religious delusions, people who feel that women are just, you know, uh, secondary citizens um, in terms of, you know, the law on earth because that is what their religion says, I mean, they... Uh, that is what they feel and if you were to say that no men and women deserve equality under the law here on earth today you would be hurting their feelings and uh, there are cases where we have to say that it's okay to do that it's okay to not be nice to people who are not doing uh, things that are good for our society that are going to be healthy for our society that are going to promote the kind of ideals that we want to see in the world what do you think of this idea where um, with the you know safe spaces they say are meant to defend minority rights. So what happens to minorities within minorities? Well, that's, I, I think that's a very interesting question and that's the, the main problem with this, with this dialogue and with this discussion is because it looks at minorities as just a group of people who all agree on, on everything and that there is um, some sort of uh, uh, you know, single, singular um, idea that they can all agree on and a policy that they can all agree on. And that's very dangerous for people, people like us, people who are ex-Muslims, who are minorities within minorities. It makes it very hard for us to speak out uh, because uh, we feel that, okay, when you are... Um, uh, somehow betraying your race, you're betraying your people, and it can become a very toxic thing. And it's, it, it is one of those things that seems like it's helping minorities and it's helping race relations, but I really think it's one of those things that is racist at its core and it's making race relations worse. You mentioned on the panel uh, an example of uh, rape law and how that's not being discussed in law classes because of these sort of safe, safe space policies. Tell us about that. Well, that was... Um, when I was researching for the panel in general, just to just to see about the impact of um, you know the discussions like safe space and microaggressions, what they've the, the impact they've had on student life and on discussion in general, it was probably the saddest thing that that I saw because it was something where you can directly see how harmful this would be for women's rights where uh, some students are so sensitized to discussions of uh, of rape um, or of uh, violent assaults. Um, T towards women that uh, they can't even discuss it 
they can't even talk about it. And especially when it comes to when it comes to rape law, when uh, professors such as the, the Harvard professor that I mentioned um, in the panel, I think her name is Jeannie Sook, she talked about how she specifically chose cases that were difficult. Uh, they were they were cases where it wasn't clear if the aggressor deserved punishment, if he, if if the aggressor really was an aggressor, if this really was rape, and and students have to pick a side and think about it and discuss the issues, um, in you know in a nuanced way. And some students found this very difficult to do, and uh, some professors, uh, she she said in her article, have have felt that they can no longer discuss rape law in class. It's just too sensitive a topic. Students are um, too easily, uh, too, too, they too easily feel that they are being, you know, uh, attacked in some way uh, or uncomfortable enough, un uncomfortable enough that they complain um, to, to the, you know, the various administrators in the universities. And so professors think, well, is it even worth discussing? And this is a, such a clear way where we can see how this is harmful towards women. We need to study rape law. We need to talk about the complexities about rape law and what it, what rape is, what an aggressor is, um, what consent is, and just the, the various the, the the gray line that that is some sometimes difficult to talk about. But we need to talk about this. Um, and this is, I think, such a clear way to see how um, these uh, discussions where people people say that I'm it's too sensitive to talk about. I can't talk about this. Um, I'm, this is hurting me too much, how this clouds our judgment, it clouds our thinking, and it disrupts learning on campus. And it could be that practically everything upsets someone, and it will end up not being able to talk about anything, basically. Absolutely, and, and uh, who will that hurt, I think, in the end? Um, if, if we look about, if, if, if we look at our society um, as a place where, you know, how they say, white males have, have a lot of power. Well, um, if that's the case, then they're not going to be the ones who are significantly hurt by discourses like this. It's going to be uh, women and minorities who bear the brunt of it, and especially minorities within minorities who really can't talk about their issues at all, who are truly silenced and have no institutional power to be able to talk about their experiences, and that's what's most devastating. And I think when we when we look at it as with these safe spaces, these microaggressions are a way to protect minorities, I don't think they are. I think some minorities, and I say some because I know many who are not, some minorities may feel safer, but. I don't think they are safer. And I think they're creating an atmosphere where, where they are significantly more in danger because we do not have the intellectual structure to support the kinds of policies that we care about that will protect minorities, that will protect women, that will protect you know sexual minorities, religious minorities. You were saying that we need to go back and find another way. What do you think those are? Well, I think uh, what's what's definitely clear is that these patronizing sort of rules on campus, we know that they don't help. We know that sometimes they make things worse and they create an atmosphere on campus where people feel like they can't talk about the issues that we really need to talk about. The issues that are very politicized, the issues where emotions really get in the way. Those are the issues that we really need to hash out. We know that this isn't helping. Um, and I can't say for sure that I have a solution. Although my feeling is, is that speech helps and empowering people and to make them especially minorities and women to make them feel like hey you can speak and if you are persuasive if you have facts you might not get through to somebody the first time but you'll do it again and again and again and it'll work and we know that it has worked because we've seen how much our society has progressed we've seen how much in in this this liberal assist intellectual system where we use words we use arguments uh, to find to, to get our way we found that women's rights have gotten better women have a have it better in in America, in the UK, in the Western world in general, than to do in in uh, the parts of the world where we can't speak at all. So we know how useful it has been in the past, and I'm worried that we're we're giving it up. We're thinking that oh well, uh, we're we're not looking at the gains that we have made throughout the decades and and centuries even by using this very important tool because we become impatient maybe with the progress, and um, so I think. Let's look back to see what's worked and respect what's worked and not be so quick to denounce it and not be so quick to throw it away because it, freedom of speech really has been what we can count on, uh, what we can count on to be there for us, those that, that don't have institutional power, those that don't have uh, financial power, we don't have any real power, but we do have this. 
we can convince people with our ideas.